top stories we're watching right now. A slight uptick in jobless claims ahead of tomorrow's jobs report are two important pieces of information about the nation's economic health. What the White House is doing to beat back fears of a recession. Plus, it is clearly now the will of the Parliamentary Conservative Party that there should be a new leader of that party and therefore a new Prime Minister. Embattled British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is stepping down. What led to his resignation and how long he's trying to hold on? And WNBA star Brittany Griner pleads guilty to a minor drug charge in Russia where she faces up to 10 years in prison. When she's in court next and what the Biden administration is doing to get her and other wrongfully detained Americans abroad back home. Plus, the morning after Michigan's Republican gubernatorial debate, one of the leading candidates pleaded not guilty to federal charges related to his appearance at the Capitol insurrection. More on Ryan Kelly's legal problems and the rest of the field vying to unseat Governor Gretchen Whitmer. And later this hour, as inflation ticks up, so too does the number of Americans unable to afford housing. More on the recent homelessness spike and what families are doing to keep from being evicted. We begin, though, with a new poll that shows only a little more than one in three Americans currently believe our system of government is stable. Just 36 percent of Americans believe our system is basically sound. That's down eight points from January 2021, which was a few weeks after the January 6th Capitol attack. It's also down 19 points from February 2020. On the flip side, the number of Americans who say our system of government is not sound at all is also at 36 percent in the latest Monmouth poll. For more on that and the day's top political stories, Marquise Francis and David Drucker join me. Marquise is senior national reporter at Yahoo News. David, senior political correspondent for The Washington Examiner. Thank you both. Marquise, when you hear numbers like that about Americans having basic doubts about our system of government, what do you think is behind all that? Yeah, um, the first thing I think of when Americans say they really are, you know, don't have as much trust in the government as they would like is I think about what makes up the government, right? At a, at a basic point, you think about the three branches, the legislative branch. We went from the do-nothing Congress, uh, the second term under President Obama, where Republicans made it a point to not help get through anything during his second term. And then we went uh, to President Trump in what I like to call the extremism Congress, where they said anything and almost did everything to bully their way through. And then, of course, now I want to say we're in this culture war kind of Congress, where instead, um, most Americans are saying they want gun safety. Most Americans say they want women to have abortion rights. Most Americans say they want Congress to act on climate change, and yet folks are focusing on CRT and banning books. And so, why would you have faith in that? And then you go to the executive branch, obviously the president, um, which is built on getting things done in Congress. And as I mentioned, Trump was able to bulldoze his way through, but now Biden has the majority in the House and the Senate, and yet members of his own party, uh, most specifically West Virginia's uh, Senator Manchin and Arizona's Senator uh, Kirsten Sinema are making it very hard on him. President Biden obviously wanted to get through that $2 trillion Build Back Better plan, and that was unable to happen, which would have helped millions of Americans. And then last but not least, the judicial uh, part of those three branches, which is the courts. And everyone likes to look at the Supreme Court and what's happening now, but that was years in the making. Under former President Trump, he made up one, he appointed one third of the current Supreme Court and also 30 percent of appellate judges, and those are both lifetime appointments. And you just look at what's happening today. I mean, uh, doing away with the separation of church and state um, and just so many different things. The real question I would even say is, why should Americans trust the government when you're seeing these things? And then last but not least, that poll noted January 6th, where it's no debate that former President Trump supporters uh, attempted a coup on Congress. And now we're having a trial to really look into who's at fault. And so when you look at all these things that have happened over the past five, 10 years, um, Americans are showing that they're definitely losing faith. So that's what's behind the cynicism, David. None of this is happening in a vacuum, though. It's really a ripe, fertile field for challengers to incumbents. And the, perhaps the biggest challenger of all would be a former President Trump announced a candidacy. There have been reports he was considering an announcement this summer. Those reports seem to be cooling off. What do you think and what does your reporting say is factoring into any potential 2024 bid by Trump? 
Well, look, I think Donald Trump likes the idea that he could win and avenge his loss from 2020. And, you know, depending on what, what time of day you catch him in, he'll acknowledge it was a loss, even though publicly he'll always complain that, that he was robbed. And, and I think the weaker President Biden looks politically, the more President Trump, former President Donald Trump, thinks about running again. I never thought it was a fait accompli that he would launch a third term, a third campaign for a second term, Scott, simply because you have to look at his age, you have to look at uh, the financial aspect of all of this, and you have to look at whether or not he wants to take a chance of losing a second time. You know, you can complain the election was stolen once, and you can get a lot of people to believe you. You lose again, and that claim just loses a lot of salience. And And so I think that President Trump is going to look at the political conditions, think about whether or not he, he thinks he can win in a general election. And I think he's going to make a lot of his decision based around that. I think that as strong as he is with Republican primary voters, and he is very strong with them, we've noticed that there are some soft spots between the armor plates. You look at some of these primaries where he endorsed candidates in Georgia and Nebraska and Idaho. Um, and Alabama, and his endorsement, his power to influence Republican primary voters has limits. And I think the fact that he is considering launching a presidential campaign before this year's midterm elections in order to box out other Republicans who want to challenge him is a sign of weakness. It's a sign that he's hears footsteps and wants to do everything he can to keep those at a minimum if, in fact, he does decide to run. A candidate that feels confident, that is strong, dictates when he or she announces they don't make a preemptive move to hold back a bunch of challengers. And make no mistake about it, there will be plenty of challengers, even if Trump runs. Sure, some will sit it out, especially the younger potential candidates in the, in the Republican field. But there are plenty that don't want to be President Biden's age when they finally get their shot. And so they will take their chances running against Trump. I think the question then becomes, do they take it to Trump in a way that's going to catch Republican voters' attention and give them a reason to look beyond the former president? Let's go deeper into that Monmouth poll. The January 6th committee hearings, according to the poll, seem to not be having quite a big an impact on the public as perhaps the committee had hoped. In the poll, which asked, have the recent House January 6th committee hearings changed your mind about what happened at the Capitol that day or who is responsible? Only 6 percent of Americans say it has, while 90 percent say it is not. So, David, from the reporting you've done, how are these committee hearings landing with conservatives and those on the right side of the aisle? Well, look, I think if you talk to Republican voters, uh, you're going to find that they've made up their mind long ago about Trump and particularly people that criticize Trump. And they're more willing to believe Trump and his acolytes than they are his critics. And I think that's just a function of how tribal uh, a country we are at the moment politically, where it's just as important to a voter who's against you than what you are for. And I think the fact that Trump continues to stick with the same line at least reinforces what they want to believe if it's not something they they actually believe. Uh, and I also believe that when you're looking at a, a period of time in which we are with skyrocketing inflation, high energy costs, and people uh, concerned about the future economically, it's hard for anything else to break through. And even though some of the things we have heard in these hearings have been stunning, have been newsmaking, and should cause people to take a second look if they're not already looking, there are just certain concerns that are overpowering. And even, look, even for Democrats and Democratic voters, you don't have to convince them of this, right? So you already have half the public, let's say, that is, is watching the hearings and going, well, of course. And sure, you filled in some of the blanks, but yeah, exactly. And by the way, I'm not happy with the Democratic leaders in Washington either. I'm just unhappy with them for different reasons than Republicans. And so I think this sort of leaves the, the hearings politically as a wash, even though what they're uncovering and what they might ultimately, ultimately might conclude are very important for the country to understand and to learn about, particularly as we look ahead to the future.
Yeah, and I think moving 6 percent of Americans on anything at this point is actually a pretty significant number. Marquise, let me shift back to the Biden administration. After they said they're pausing those controversial ICE raids, the U.S. Marshal Service has new details on the so-called Operation North Star. The results? More than 1,500 arrests in the past month in 10 major U.S. cities. So the question is, how is the issue of crime factoring into this national political conversation? Uh, well, we don't have to look much further than this past weekend to see how crime is affecting the U.S., right? Over July 4th weekend, we saw two officers were uh, grazed in Philadelphia. We saw seven people were killed um, right outside of Chicago at Highland Park. And then also, not that long ago, about a month and a half ago, we saw what happened with Alde, where innocent children and two, teacher, two teachers were killed. And so gun violence is all around us. And it's Definitely noteworthy that this operation took place. 1,500 fugitives, violent criminals, sex offenders were taken off the streets. But when we look at what the real issues are in this country when it comes to gun violence, partic particularly domestic terrorism, we have to look at what's causing it, right? These are mostly white men who have access to high-powered guns, right? And we talk about what most Americans want. Most Americans want movement on gun safety. And when you look at different cities and what they've done to tamper down on gun safety, I just did a, a, a report on Newark, New Jersey, where seven years ago, the DOJ had to step in because they were perennially top 10 on the worst and most dangerous cities in America. Fast forward to today, they're no longer even on the top 50. And what they did there is they actually put the community along with police officers together, hosting biweekly roundtables, actually investing in rapid response teams who you know, most times police are called when it comes to mental health crisis and different ordeals, and they're not really trained to deal with these things. So the community actually invested in those programs. And in 2020, no officers fired a single bullet. And that's a long way from where they were in 2014. And you just it just begs to question if more cities took this kind of action, what could that look like in the future? And that's not to say North New Jersey doesn't have its problems, because they also had an issue in a shooting not that long ago, but it's showing progress. And what we need to continue to see is progress. And it's noteworthy, 1,500 criminals off the street, sex offenders, and they're killing people. But also, we're seeing domestic terrorism time and time again. We have Buffalo. We have Uvalde. Almost every month, it seems like a new mass shooting. So I think the DOJ and the Biden administration has to look forward to what can they do to do more. Midterms are coming up, and people are definitely thinking of crime at the top of their mind. New York Times first reported former FBI Director James Comey and his deputy, Andy McCabe, underwent some intensive tax audits. The odds of being selected for such an audit is pretty low. We learned this afternoon a government watchdog will look into this matter. David, what are the odds? that those audits from two people heavily criticized by former President Trump are coincidental? And what is the significance of any weaponizing of the IRS? Well, look, I mean, I, I never want to rule out a weird coincidence uh, when it comes to the U.S. government, uh, because sometimes these things happen, and, and um, it's one of the reasons people don't like the IRS so much. Um, but it, it certainly raises questions about what exactly was happening there. I mean, the, the former president himself used to like to, let's see, speak in jest about what he would like to be able to use the levers of government for when it came to his political critics and enemies. And and so I think, look, I think that the, um, the watchdog, the government watchdog will investigate this. I think we'll find out what happened, if anything happened. Um, I think it's important not to rush to any judgment. We've seen, however, in the past, uh, the IRS you know, weaponized to go after critics of a particular administration or a party. Uh, sometimes these things can be more complicated, though they're not always directed from the top, but sometimes they come from within. Uh, so let's see what happens here. But it wouldn't, it, it, it wouldn't surprise me that either happened, right? I mean, if we find out that this was some sort of Trump-ordered punishment, would any of us be surprised? No. If we found out that it was just the government being the government doing weird things, that also wouldn't surprise anybody. Wouldn't be surprising to see congressional investigations launched about this either. David Drucker, Marquise Francis, we covered a lot of ground. Thank you both. Boris Johnson announces his resignation, why the British prime minister says he's no longer fit to lead the country, why voters seem to agree, and who is in the running to replace him. Plus, Brittany Griner is back in a Moscow court for her trial on drug possession charges, what her plea means for efforts to bring her back home.
You're streaming Red and Blue. An original documentary from CBS reports. It's really big. The metaverse, the virtual world that's become a cryptocurrency casino. It's like yeah. buying property on Mars. Do they get an actual picture of this? No, it's a digital copy. Why would they pay for that? Making millionaires almost overnight. We made more than a million dollars in crypto last year. I have no idea how much money I have made over the past year. That's like, wow. Big rewards. There's gold in them, there hills, as they say. Bigger risks. The market's down, but it's going to bounce back. It's crypto. Is it a gold rush or fool's gold? It's our metaverse, our story. Peace out, y'all. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Stream now. I'm Nora O'Donnell in our nation's capital. We're here at the White House with the President of the United States. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. We've never done an interview like this before. That's correct. Tonight, a congressional investigation sparked by reporting from CBS News. What's your message to consumers? They need help now. Tell him I feel it. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell from Washington, D.C. on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. We will witness yet another moment in history. This week on 60 Minutes. That. That's incredible. The 60 minutes. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. Are you ready for some tough questions? Let me ask you this. You know how this sounds. What's your response to that? 60 Minutes Sundays on CBS. The threat of severe weather and dangerous tornadoes is expected to last. Let's get the forecast from our partners at the Weather Channel. Here we are in our virtual view. Now six feet of water, imagine that. Cars that can act like battering rams. These hyper-realistic simulations show you what the weather will look and feel like before it happens. This is our virtual view, what it actually looks like. Those are some of the best graphics I've seen. Spare no expense, Gail. <laughs> we experience the weather in a whole new way. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. <laughs> and reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da -da -da. and truly original That's reporting. Great. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. People from every corner of America facing challenges. Everyone is just looking for some type of connection. Just raise your hand and say, hey, I'd like to help. Coming together to find solutions. We are going to do something about it. Their stories are our stories. Welcome to Eye on America. Stream now on the free CBS News app. We have an inspiring story that started with a strange act of kindness. Yeah. We found it. You're kidding me. We share stories that lift you up and brighten your day. The Uplift. Stream on the free CBS News app. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is resigning after a series of scandals which cost him the support of his own party. Johnson says his replacement will be chosen next week, and he vows to stay in office until that happens. Ian Lee has more from London. Crowds gathered at 10 Downing Street, singing and holding signs for Boris Johnson's announcement that he's stepping down as British Prime Minister. I want you to know how sad I am to be giving up the best job in the world. But them's the breaks. Johnson's resignation came after more than 50 members of his own Conservative Party quit and urged him to do the same. Anyone quitting now after defending all that, hasn't got a shred of integrity. One of the biggest sources of frustration with Johnson was the so-called Partygate scandal. Leaked photos appear to show the prime minister and members of his government holding booze-filled social gatherings in the early days of the country's COVID lockdowns. He's a disgrace. I'm just surprised it took him so long, really. What finally brought Johnson down was the crisis that erupted after an official he appointed was accused of groping men at a private members club. After first denying he knew of previous sexual misconduct complaints against Chris Pincher, Johnson had to apologize and admit he had been briefed before. In, in hindsight, it was uh, the wrong thing to do. I uh, apologize to everybody who's been uh, badly affected. Thursday, Johnson expressed some remorse he didn't complete everything he set out to do when he swept to power in 2019. Of course, it's painful not to be able to see through so many ideas and, and projects myself. 
He says he'll remain in office until a new prime minister is chosen. Ian Lee, CBS News, London. For more on this, let's bring in CBS News correspondent Christina Ruffini. Christina, remind us how Boris Johnson came to this position and what ultimately led to his demise from this position. Hey there. I mean, I think you got a pretty good summary from our colleague across the pond. Um, and I have to say, I think more U.S. politicians could stand for some of those question time thrashings they get over there getting yelled at in Parliament by different politicians. That's beside the point. You know, he got to start kind of as the mayor of London. He was this bike riding, messy haired kind of character. Then he was really prominent in the Brexit. Uh, mo uh, motion. He was like one of the chief Brexiteer supporters. And then he got elected as an MP. Eventually he went on to be the head of the Conservative Party. And then in 2019 he had this kind of record breaking election where the Conservative Party won more seats than they had since the 1980s. So Boris Johnson, for all his controversies, and he's always been a little bit of a controversial figure, he's always had a bit of a loose relationship with the truth, but he was seen as a vote getter, so he maintained support. However, as, as was mentioned, it wasn't necessarily the scandals that ultimately got him, but it was the lying about knowing about the scandals. Look, you had those COVID controversies. What seems to have been the, uh, the last straw for many of his colleagues was this politician he appointed saying he didn't know that he had this history of sexual harassment allegations against him. That turned out not to be true. He did know, so that seems to be the impetus to a lot of his, his colleagues resigning their posts. And, you know, as he said today, them's the breaks, and that's, that's how we got here. Well, what can you tell us about his recent phone call with Volodymyr Zelensky in Ukraine? The problem when you lose a head of government, and the British system is a little bit different. Remember, he's the head of the party, so the party you, you vote for the party, not the individual, and then he gets elected. So basically, the same party is in power, and I think that was part of the call, was to reassure Zelensky there's this very tenuous alliance with all these European nations standing behind Ukraine, and anything like this could, could ruffle it, could rupture it. And so the call was about reassuring Zelensky that the U.K., no matter who was in charge, was going to be behind him, that the alliance was going to stay strong. And he said, he said he finished the call by saying, you're a hero and everybody loves you. Let's talk a bit about the G20, the summit in Indonesia. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken's there. Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, are there. These are interesting times between the two countries, between the war in Ukraine and Russia's detention of American citizens. They're very significant issues between the countries. So would those two possibly meet at the summit? You know, it's like when you have to go to a big family wedding with that cousin you're feuding with and you'll have to sit at the head table, but you're not really talking to each other. Uh, I think it's unlikely we're going to see the two of them meet. It's not on the schedule, but never say never. You know, they're always hoping for a diplomatic breakthrough at any point. And both Ukraine and the U.S. have said they're willing to talk to Russia if they think they can make uh, make a difference. Now, a senior State Department official did say today that it can't be business as usual with Russia at the G7, given the aggression against Ukraine. So there are things that... The, Sorry, the G20, the G7 was a few weeks ago. Uh, you know, there are things this group of leaders wants to get done, and the U.S. officials said they are committed to making sure those get done, those issues get addressed, and Russia does not derail the progress or the agenda. However, it is the elephant in the room, and it likely will be addressed several times whether they want to or not. Always excellent reporting. Christina Ruffini, thank you very much. Thanks so much. Former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin was sentenced today for violating George Floyd's civil rights. Chauvin, who pleaded guilty in December, will also be required to pay restitution. CBS News' Jennifer Merrily has more from Minneapolis. Former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin has been sentenced to 245 months, a little more than 20 years, in a federal prison for violating George Floyd's civil rights. The sentence is part of a plea deal. In entering the plea, it was the first time Chauvin admitted he used excessive force when he knelt on Floyd's neck. During Thursday's hearing, Chauvin did not offer the Floyd family an apology. Instead, he said he wishes all the best for Floyd's children. I wish she would have just probably said that how sorry he was, but that's not going to bring my brother back. Floyd's family attended the hearing. I'm just upset that he didn't get the maximum amount of time. He had his knee on my brother's neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds. Uh, Chauvin showed that he had no conscience. He showed no empathy. He showed no compassion.
Chauvin is already serving a 22 and a half year sentence for his conviction on state murder and manslaughter charges at Minnesota's only maximum security prison. As part of today's plea deal, he will be moved from a state prison where he is serving his sentence in solitary confinement to a federal prison, which is viewed as being safer. Jennifer Merrily, CBS News, Minneapolis. What happens when your party's leading candidate gets raided by the FBI? Michigan Republicans are about to find out as their leading pick to unseat Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer was pleading not guilty in a virtual court appearance this morning. We'll talk local matters, Michigan, next. Plus, the historic overturning of Roe v. Wade by the Supreme Court putting countless women in limbo after clinics around the country shudder, where women seeking abortion services are forced to go now. You're streaming CBS News. An original documentary from CBS reports. It's really big. The metaverse, the virtual world that's become a cryptocurrency casino. It's like yeah. buying property on Mars. Do they get an actual picture of this? No, it's a digital copy. Why would they pay for that? Making millionaires almost overnight. We made more than a million dollars in crypto last year. I have no idea how much money I have made over the past year. That's like, wow. Big rewards. There's gold in them, there are hills, as they say. Bigger risks. The market's down, but it's going to bounce back. It's crypto. Is it a gold rush or fool's gold? It's our metaverse, our story. Peace out, y'all. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Stream now. I'm Nora O'Donnell in our nation's capital. We're here at the White House with the President of the United States. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You've never done an interview like this before. That's correct. Tonight, a congressional investigation sparked by reporting from CBS News. What's your message to consumers? They need help now. Tell him I feel it. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell from Washington, D.C. on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. We will witness yet another moment in history. This week on 60 Minutes. That. That's incredible. The 60 minutes. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. Are you ready for some ready? tough questions? Yeah. Let me ask you this. You know how this sounds. What's your response to that? Are you ready? 60 Minutes Sundays on CBS. The threat of severe weather and dangerous tornadoes is expected to last. Let's get the forecast from our partners at the Weather Channel. Here we are in our virtual view. Now six feet of water, imagine that. Cars that can act like battering rams. These hyper-realistic simulations show you what the weather will look and feel like before it happens. This is our virtual view, what it actually looks like. Those are some of the best graphics I've seen. Spare no expense, Gail. <laughs> we experience the weather in a whole new way. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. <laughs> and reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative <laughs> and truly original That's reporting. Great. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. People from every corner of America facing challenges. Everyone is just looking for some type of connection. Just raise your hand and say, hey, I'd like to help. Coming together to find solutions. We are going to do something about it. Their stories are our stories. Welcome to Eye on America. Stream now on the free CBS News app. We have an inspiring story that started with a strange act of kindness. Yeah. We found it. You're kidding me. We share stories that lift you up and brighten your day. The Uplift. Stream on the free CBS News app. Welcome back to Red and Blue. Here's a look at some of our top stories. The Labor Department is reporting a slight increase in unemployment claims ahead of Friday's jobs report. The monthly snapshot expected to show a historically low unemployment rate as businesses struggle to fill near record high amounts of job openings. Plus, detained WNBA player Brittany Griner has pleaded guilty to minor drug charges in Russia. Griner has been in custody in Russia since February and faces up to 10 years in prison. And the head of the IRS has asked a watchdog to investigate the decision to conduct rare tax audits of former FBI Director James Comey and former FBI Deputy Director Andy McCabe.
Less than a month until the pivotal primary elections in Michigan. There's a race for governor and the state legislature there in a state narrowly won by President Biden in 2020 and narrowly by former President Trump in 2016. But even before the ballots are cast, there have been winners and losers and drama as several contenders for the Republican nomination for governor were disqualified for failing to produce a proper number of valid signatures to get on the ballot. And of the candidates remaining, one of them was in court Thursday. Ryan Kelly of West Michigan is charged in the U.S. Capitol breach. He pleaded not guilty at his arraignment in a lower-level case, and his next court appearance is set for September 22nd. That's less than 50 days before the general election, if he's the nominee. For more on this, let's bring in Aaron Navarro and Rachel Louise Just. Aaron is a CBS News Political Unit associate producer who's been tracking this race closely. And Rachel is a political reporter from our West Michigan affiliate WWMT television. Rachel's in Lansing. Let's start with you. And let's focus first on last night's debate. Take a listen. You know, January 6th, yes, I was in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. Yes, the FBI did raid my house in front of my wife, in front of my children, uh, put on this big theater show for misdemeanor charges. We were there protesting the government because we don't like the results of the 2020 election, the process of how it happened. And we have that First Amendment right. And that's what 99% of the people were there for that day. Yes, the 2020 election, in the state of Michigan was fraudulent and it was stolen from President Trump. Yes, just like Mr. Kelly said, you know, um, they turned our elections here in the state of Michigan like New York and California overnight. Well, we have to question what happens in an election when the Secretary of State changes the rules right before the election. Yeah, there's no question that there was fraud. There's no question that 2,000 mules shows us how it was done. Uh, different candidates, but uniform election denialism. Rachel, what did you see in the room? What were your big takeaways? Yeah, well, Scott, we're now about a month out from this election, and we still do not have a clear front runner in this race. As you mentioned, that's because we've seen half of these candidates drop out because of fraudulent signatures that were gathered just to get on the ballot. Now, it's kind of a race for first here. Um, recent polling we've seen here in Michigan has shown that around 50% of voters are undecided on who they even want. So last night was really about just standing out to the other voters to making sure that they take that top spot to try and make sure that they get those votes um, as soon as possible. Um, really what I'm seeing from these voters is kind of jumping over to an extreme. As you saw there, a lot of election denialism. We had pretty much all those candidates at least putting skepticism towards the election in 2020. And as you saw there, Ryan Kelly not ashamed, not hiding from the fact that he was arrested and is being charged with four misdemeanor counts related to January 6th. He wouldn't be the first political candidate to try to wear his arrest as a badge of honor in a Republican primary. Aaron, the governor's seat is held by Democratic incumbent Gretchen Whitmer, who has seen her stature rise quite a bit on the national stage over the past couple of years. And she steered Michigan through COVID. She has dealt with threats against her and her family. How competitive is this race viewed in a general election? Very competitive. Scott, a pollster today who does work for Republicans and media outlets in Michigan told me their latest numbers show Whitmer up 2% against the generic Republican in November. And that's even after all the shuffling of candidates. And after one notable one, former Detroit police chief James Craig was taken off the ballot. You mentioned Whitmer's COVID response. That is one thing Republicans think will still be a resonant message against her in this November election. The lockdowns, the handling of nursing homes were both brought up in last night's debate. To them, you pair that with the political environment that's already tough for Democrats on the economy, inflation, Biden's low approval rating. Republicans have argued that creates a tough path for Whitmer. Michigan Democrats I've talked to are confident she can hold on, but they also know it'll be a close race. And her campaign has been pre preparing for that. She had raised $14.3 million in 2021 alone. So both sides are definitely expecting a tough race ahead for sure. So if the margin is so narrow, turnout's going to be critical in November for the incumbent. Rachel, what do we know about potential turnout you know, from absentee ballots to Election Day? And what can we expect this year? We're starting to get our very first peak of that these last couple of weeks. Just about two weeks ago, we saw the uh, option for uh, Michiganders to begin to file to, or excuse me, to apply to get an absentee ballot here in Michigan. And you don't need to be out of state or have any reason to get that absentee ballot. With that, we had about 875,000 people, more than that probably at this point, applying to get an absentee ballot. That is a huge, huge jump from the last midterm primary we saw in 2018. About 507,000 people had uh, asked 
for it at this point out from the election. So I think, Scott, it's just showing that people are kind of starting to shift towards that absentee ballot. Of course, that creates create some of its own challenges, but I think it's starting to show that people are very engaged with this election, even if they're not totally sure where they're going to land on it. And in Michigan, though, it's hard to get a high profile legislative race because of term limits, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, if, I think high profile for here is very different than high profile nationally. And with the term limits that we have here, you know, that's actually something that we're going to see on the ballot come November. We're going to see an option to expand our term limits um, overall in one chamber while limiting them overall. So I think that I guess we also get to see how people really feel about term limits here come November as well. Aaron, let's put this in context. It's a close state, but does that mean it's a bellwether state? Is this a state that could forecast anything nationally or ahead of 2024? Absolutely. The governor's mansion is up this year, and the new legislative and congressional maps have maintained or created competitive seats across the state. Both parties are definitely watching Michigan this November. Trump. Uh, the former president has endorsed at least 18 candidates in the state, a bulk of them being state legislative candidates, particularly those that have given credence or backed his debunked claim of a stolen election in 2020. The race for secretary of state this year could have a huge impact on 2024 and how and what absentee ballot access looks like uh, for residents in the state. And even on the Democratic side, there is a real chance for Michigan to get into that early window of primary states to either replace Iowa or be added as a fifth state for Democratic voters choosing their nominee. During their pitch to the Democratic National Committee, Michigan Democrats argued that Michigan is one of the most important battlegrounds in the country and will remain so. The DNC will finalize that lineup, that lineup later this year, but that push certainly adds to Michigan's importance in 2024 as a competitive battleground swing state. Let me take advantage of Rachel being with us from Lansing. Rachel, what are the counties that are the epicenter of a Republican primary in Michigan? Should I assume it's the same counties we heard about in 2020, Macomb County, those suburban Detroit counties? Yeah, I think that's going to be an interesting place for us to be looking, especially as you pointed out, Macomb County. And, and Scott, I know you're familiar with the Detroit area, so that's always a really interesting county to look into. And interestingly enough, that is where Donald Trump held his last rally here. So I think he's probably aware of that as well, seeing if he can stoke some good graces along those voters there. Live in Ingham County, it's Rachel Justin in Washington, D.C., Aaron Navarro. We thank you both. Mississippi's only abortion clinic is closed after a judge denied the facility's request to block a trigger law banning the procedure. The Republican-led state is one of many imposing new restrictions on abortion in the wake of the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe v. Wade. Michael George has the details. Advocates and opponents of abortion rights were back outside Jackson Women's Health Organization, even though as of today, most abortions are banned. Some patients had checkup appointments, but the owner says she'll close the clinic permanently. Abortion is now only legal in Mississippi if the pregnant person's life is in danger or if the pregnancy is caused by a rape and was reported to law enforcement. Mississippi had a trigger law that hung on the U.S. Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade. Following the ruling, the clinic sued the state, citing a right to privacy in the state constitution. Tuesday, a judge rejected that argument. Paloma Wu with the Mississippi Center of Justice was part of the Supreme Court battle and last-ditch effort to keep the clinic open. This sets us back what the Supreme Court did. We, we have to keep on going with advocacy. That means legal advocacy. But lawyers need to recalibrate. They need to support the women who are doing the work of helping other women. On Wednesday, clinic escorts used kazoos to drown out anti-abortion protesters who call Mississippi's new law a partial victory for children. There's still, uh, you know, pills that, that they, these people will be able to access to to destroy babies. But I would say it is a positive is a positive move in the right direction. The owners of the Mississippi Clinic plan to open a new clinic in Las Cruces, New Mexico, about an hour's drive from El Paso, Texas. Michael George, CBS News, New York. North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper has signed an executive order protecting abortion access in his state. The order will protect existing services in North Carolina, including to state that patients who receive abortions or providers who perform them will not be penalized or criminalized for reproductive health care services. The Democrats' executive action does not change North Carolina law. It ensures state residents will continue to have protected abortion rights. A new report confirms police could have stopped the Uvalde school shooting on multiple occasions before 19 children and two teachers were killed. Janet Shamlian has more. 
Stunning new information details missed opportunities Uvalde police had in preventing the Robb Elementary massacre. An officer armed with a rifle had the gunman in sight as a shooter approached the school building, but didn't fire. Instead, the report indicates the officer asked his supervisor for permission to shoot the suspect. The supervisor either did not hear or responded too late. The use of force decisions always rest with the officer who's going to use the force. There was no requirement for that officer to ask for permission to shoot. The report highlights another missed chance. The first officer arriving on the scene might have seen the gunman to prevent him from entering the building if he hadn't been driving so fast or instead approached on foot. And the report concludes what many have believed, that based on current evidence, it is possible that some of the people who died could have been saved if they had received more rapid medical care. We believe there should have been an entry at that as soon as you can. The new information follows last week's emotional city council meeting. This was not, not supposed to happen. You failed because you are not taking care of the city. They are 19 Dead. children. Dead. Dead. Massacred. A Texas legislative committee is also investigating and is expected to release its report soon. Janet Shamley and CBS News. The accused gunman in the Buffalo, New York mass shooting at a supermarket appeared in court today. The 18-year-old self-described white supremacist is accused of killing 10 black people and wounding three others at a top supermarket in May. Today's hearing was for the 25-count indictment in New York State Court, including 10 first-degree murder charges. If he's found guilty, he'll receive life in prison without the possibility of parole. The accused shooter is also facing 26 federal charges. A month-long operation has removed 1,500 violent fugitives from the streets of 10 major U.S. cities across the country, from L.A. to New York. U.S. Marshal for the Northern District of Illinois, LaDon Reynolds, touted the success of Operation North Star Thursday. Operation North Star was concentrated on fugitives wanted from the most serious, violent, and harmful offenses such as homicide, forcible sexual assault, uh, robbery, and aggravated assault. Operation North Star investigators focused and prioritized offenses that were involving firearms and individuals who had a heightened indicator for violence. Officials say 230 of those arrested were wanted for homicide, 131 for sexual assault, and the operation also seized 166 firearms and more than 33 kilograms of drugs. While unemployment in the U.S. remains low, rising inflation is forcing many more Americans out on the streets. Over learning about Americans dealing with homelessness for the first time and what could potentially reverse the trend, you're streaming Red and Blue. An original documentary from CBS reports. The metaverse, the virtual world that's become a cryptocurrency casino. It's like yeah. buying property on Mars. Do they get an actual picture of this? No, it's a digital copy. Why would they pay for that? Making millionaires almost overnight. We made more than a million dollars in crypto last year. I have no idea how much money I have made over the past year. That's like, wow. Big rewards. There's gold in them, their hills, as they say. Bigger risks. The market's down, but it's going to bounce back. It's crypto. Is it a gold rush or fool's gold? It's our metaverse, our story. Peace out, y'all. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Stream now. I'm Nora O'Donnell in our nation's capital. We're here at the White House with the President of the United States. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. We've never done an interview like this before. That's correct. Tonight, a congressional investigation sparked by reporting from CBS News. What's your message to consumers? They need help now. Tell him I feel it. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell from Washington, D.C. on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. We will witness yet another moment in history. This week on 60 Minutes. That. That's incredible. The 60 minutes. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. Are you ready for some tough questions? Let me ask you this. You know how this sounds. What's your response to that? Are you ready? 60 minutes Sundays on CBS. The threat of severe weather and dangerous tornadoes is expected to last. Let's get the forecast from our partners at the Weather Channel. Here we are in our virtual view. Now six feet of water, imagine that. Cars that can act like battery rams. These hyper-realistic simulations show you what the weather will look and feel like before it happens. 
This is our virtual view, what it actually looks like. Those are some of the best graphics I've seen. Spare no expense, Gail. <laughs> we experience the weather in a whole new way. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. <laughs> and reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Multiple to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da -da -da -da. and truly original That's reporting. Right. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. People from every corner of America facing challenges. Everyone is just looking for some type of connection. Just raise your hand and say, hey, I'd like to help. Coming together to find solutions. We are going to do something about it. Their stories are our stories. Welcome to Eye on America. Stream now on the free CBS News app. We have an inspiring story that started with a strange act of kindness. Yeah. We found it. You're kidding me. We share stories that lift you up and brighten your day. The Uplift. Stream on the free CBS News app. The number of Americans filing first-time unemployment claims is at its highest point in nearly six months. 235,000 people filed jobless claims in the week ending July 2nd. That's up 4,000 from the previous week. And it marks the highest number of filings since mid-January. The new numbers come one day after the Labor Department reported 11.3 million U.S. job openings at the end of May. Rising housing costs and inflation are leading to more people living on the street. The Washington Post reports homeless shelters are seeing an increase in the number of people looking for a place to stay. Wait lists for some shelters have doubled over the past few months. Economics correspondent for The Washington Post, Abba Batrai, joins me now. And Abba, we thank you for your time. We know the median rent, the median, was more than $2,000 a month in May. How does that compare historically, and what's the relationship between rent prices and homelessness? That's absolutely right. Median rents are above $2,000 for the first time ever. And we're starting to see, you know, huge astronomical rent increases across the country, 20, 30, sometimes even 40 percent in some cities. And what that means for renters is that, you know, when their lease comes up for renewal or when they look for a new place to live, many of them are finding that they're simply priced out. Um, and even if they have money to afford something, um, they often, you know, find they run into long waiting lists and can't find what they need in time, which leaves them without a place to live. In your report, you say homeless shelters are seeing an increase in requests. Now, how have the shelters been adapting to the increase in requests and why is it so hard to get real, firm, accurate numbers on homelessness in general? Getting homelessness figures is notoriously difficult because, you know, you're relying on a makeshift patchwork of counts. And, you know, many people, um, only about 20 percent of homeless people are actually chronically homeless and living in shelters or on the street. Many more are living on a friend's couch or patching together motels, living in their cars. So it's really hard to get an accurate count of exactly who is struggling with homelessness at any given point. We know mortgage rates are up, up off a lot across the country. Are people who were once homeowners being forced out into homelessness? Some of them are. I mean, I spoke to a few who had paid off their homes, and now they were having trouble keeping up with these soaring property taxes that we're seeing. And so as a result, they were being foreclosed on or at risk of foreclosure. Well, you spoke with people experiencing homelessness for your report. What are they saying about how they ended up that way? You know, it was sort of all across the board. Many of them still had jobs, in some cases, very good paying jobs. They just simply couldn't afford to find a place to live anymore. Um, several of them said that their lease came up for renewal and they just couldn't afford a 20 or 30 percent increase. And when they started looking around, they saw that there was really there were very few options for their price range. We know the major cities do homeless point in time counts. Um, is it more difficult to navigate this in a suburban or a rural world where perhaps they're not doing that kind of data collection? Yeah, you know, that data collection varies from locality to locality, and there's often a lag. So the numbers we're seeing now are for homelessness last year or even two years ago. So it's really hard to get an accurate picture of how things look right now at this moment. So that we will see these numbers from this moment in time in 2023, 2024. That's right. Abba Batrai from The Washington Post. Thank you very much. Thank you.
The Biden administration is giving close to a billion dollars to 85 airports for upgrades. The funding was approved as part of the infrastructure bill the president signed last November. The grant announced today is just the first installment of $5 billion in airport funding included in that bill. The money will go toward new terminals and new facilities in airports across the country. We'll take a quick break right now. In the meantime, you have a couple of minutes to download the free CBS News app on all your devices. You can catch live local coverage from across the country from all of our CBS stations. And while you're at it, check out Paramount Plus. We have a mountain of content for you to stream there as well, including your favorite shows, movies, and sports. An original documentary from CBS reports. It's going to be big. The metaverse, the virtual world that's become a cryptocurrency casino. It's like yeah. buying property on Mars. Do they get an actual picture of this? No, it's a digital copy. Why would they pay for that? Making millionaires almost overnight. We made more than a million dollars in crypto last year. I have no idea how much money I have made over the past year. That's like, wow. Big rewards. There's gold in them, there hills, as they say. Bigger risks. The market's down, but it's going to bounce back. It's crypto. Is it a gold rush or fool's gold? It's our metaverse, our story. Peace out, y'all. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Stream now. I'm Nora O'Donnell in our nation's capital. We're here at the White House with the President of the United States. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You've never done an interview like this before. That's correct. Tonight, a congressional investigation sparked by reporting from CBS News. What's your message to consumers? They need help now. Tell him I feel it. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell from Washington, D.C. on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. We will witness yet another moment in history. This week on 60 Minutes. That. Ooh, that's incredible. The 60 minutes. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. Are you ready for some ready? tough questions? Yeah. Let me ask you this. You know how this sounds. What's your response to that? Are you ready? 60 Minutes Sundays on CBS. The threat of severe weather and dangerous tornadoes is expected to last. Let's get the forecast from our partners at the Weather Channel. Here we are in our virtual view. Now six feet of water, imagine that. Cars that can act like battering rams. These hyper-realistic simulations show you what the weather will look and feel like before it happens. This is our virtual view, what it actually looks like. Those are some of the best graphics I've seen. Spare no expense, Gail. <laughs> we experience the weather in a whole new way. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. <laughs> and reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Multiple to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da -da -da. and truly original That's reporting. Great. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. People from every corner of America facing challenges. Everyone is just looking for some type of connection. Just raise your hand and say, hey, I'd like to help. Coming together to find solutions. We are going to do something about it. Their stories are our stories. Welcome to Eye on America. Stream now on the free CBS News app. We have an inspiring story that started with a strange act of kindness. Yeah. We found it. You're kidding me. We share stories that lift you up and brighten your day. The Uplift. Stream on the free CBS News app. President Biden has awarded 17 Americans the Presidential Medal of Freedom. The recipient's work includes advancements in civil rights, politics, the arts, and world peace. Skylar Henry is at the White House with more. A diverse group of Americans received the nation's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom at the White House Thursday. An extraordinary, extraordinary group of Americans up here on this stage that I have the honor to recognize today. The most recognizable honoree, gymnast Simone Biles, an advocate for mental health and sexual abuse victims. Today, she adds to her medal count of 32. I don't know you're going to find room. <laughs> U.S. soccer champion Megan Rapino has recently been at the forefront of the battle for gender pay equity more than four decades after Wilma Vaught broke barriers as one of few women generals in the U.S. Armed Forces. New York nurse Sandra Lindsay was the first person in the U.S. to receive a COVID-19 vaccine, while Father Alexander Carluzos of the Greek Orthodox Church has advised presidents. Those honored for their leadership on civil rights and social issues include Sister Simone Campbell, Fred Gray, 
Diane Nash, former ambassador Raul Isaguirre, Julieta Garcia, and Gold Star father Kazir Khan, an outspoken critic of former President Trump. The president also presented awards to previous congressional colleagues, former Wyoming Senator Alan Simpson, and former Arizona Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords, an outspoken survivor of gun violence. Three recipients, Apple co-founder Steve Jobs, labor leader Richard Trumka, and long-serving Arizona Senator John McCain received the award posthumously. To the families, I know receiving this award on behalf of their loved one is bittersweet. President Biden himself received the Medal of Freedom in 2017 while serving as vice president under former President Barack Obama. Skyler Henry, CBS News, the White House. President Biden will become the third U.S. president to receive Israel's Presidential Medal of Honor during his trip to Jerusalem next week. Both Presidents Bill Clinton and Barack Obama were presented with the medal in 2013. It's given to people who have made outstanding contributions to the state of Israel or to humanity through their talents, services, or in any other form. In a tweet, the Israeli president says he's grateful to President Biden for his, quote, decades-long support for Israel's security, deepening our alliance, and fighting anti-Semitism. That does it for today. You can stream Red and Blue Monday to Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern. And a reminder, if you want to watch previous episodes of the program, you can see them anytime on the CBS News website. Just head to cbsnews.com slash red and blue. An original documentary from CBS reports. The metaverse, the virtual world that's become a cryptocurrency casino. 